I want to show you a new Mike 11 paper that's just coming out, but first we need to review some foundational basics of evolutionary theory. Namely, that the genome provides the information to construct the body, construct the anatomy. Of course, it depends on the nutrients that are available in the environment and so forth. If there's not enough nutrients, you're going to have problems. But nonetheless, the genome provides the information to construct the anatomy. So you see the arrow going one way here from the genome to the anatomy. Now, where does this come from? The basic idea behind evolution, remember, is mutations. You have mutations in the DNA. Mutations are usually not good things. Uh, they usually don't help. But once in a rare while, so goes the theory, you get lucky. So an individual gets a mutation that might help it somehow, makes it smarter or faster or stronger or something, such that it can have more progeny, more children, it can reproduce more. There's a differential, a reproductive differential. And therefore, in the next generation, that mutation is overrepresented. It spreads. It spreads through the population, this mutation. That process is called natural selection. So that's the whole idea behind evolutionary theory. You have mutations, blind um, mutations that don't know what the need is at the moment. They're, they're unguided, blind mutations. Once in a while get lucky, natural selection will um, propagate those through the population. That's the general idea. And so all of the advancements, all of the evolutionary innovations that can ever occur, they must be happening in the genome. That's the only way evolution advances. It's the only way evolution builds things, creates new species, modifies the species, and so forth. It's through these mutations happening in the DNA. So it is that genome that's, that's so important, that's key, that's crucial, that's central to evolutionary thinking that the genome is where all of the innovation happens, all of the information is stored, all of the information is going to flow from. And that's going, that information is used to build the body in this very complicated process of building an, an individual uh, and then operating the individual throughout the lifetime. All of this comes from the genome. So that's basic to evolutionary theory. It's crucial to evolutionary theory. If there's any problem with this idea, then evolution is not a fact. And I'm putting it lightly, of course. If there's any significant problem, any reason to doubt, any issues with this idea, then evolution is not a good theory. Evolution is contradicted by the science, if that's the case. It, this is how crucial it is, so central to evolutionary thinking. You cannot have a break in this idea. Well, this idea has broken down many times for many reasons uh, over the decades and centuries since Darwin proposed his theory of evolution. There's all kinds of problems with this idea. It is not good science. It's contradicted by the science. I'll quickly list out some of the problems. One is that there's not enough time. There's just not enough time for these mutations to occur. Now, these mutations, as I said, are rare. A good mutation or a mutation that's not harmful, it's, it's going to be propagated, isn't that common. And you are going to have a slow buildup of these mutations. There's just not enough time. Even evolutionists are reckoning with this now. This was pointed out back in the 1960s to evolutionists by mathematicians. And the response of the evolutionists was, well, evolution is a fact, so something must be wrong with your calculations. There's got to be something more to it. Interesting research problem. This is the way evolutionists think. They start out with the premise, evolution is a fact. That trumps the science. So that's why this is, that's a consequence of the religion in evolutionary thought. It's a religious idea and it mandates evolution to be true, that trumps the science. And that was a good example of it back in the 1960s. Mathematicians said, hey, there's not enough time here. That doesn't matter, said the evolutionists. Must be something wrong with your calculations because it's a fact. Another problem is the environment. You, you, however you want to hypothesize a, a population, a species being built up, a, a life form evolving somehow, 
um, even th though that in, in and of itself is, is, is a large problem just because of the time, as I pointed out, um, th that's not going to work. Even if you were to somehow get lucky, it needs to exist in an environment. There has to be nutrients. There are other populations, other organisms. Um, there's no scientific evidence that you can do this uh, and, and without the nutrients, without the sorts of um, in the environment and ecological niches that exist. In today's, in today's biological world, we have all these cycles. And so um, populations and organisms are, are, get, are getting their nutrients and they're providing nutrients to other, other species and other populations. It's all a complex web, a biological web. Um, so if you're going to build, evolve new species, evolve life, it doesn't just happen in a vacuum. There's a context. There's an ecological context that has to happen within. So not only are you having to evolve a, a population, a species, but you're having to evolve the environment around it as well. And so you're not, your problem is just that much more difficult. There's no scientific evidence that this could work. Um, a th another problem is within the organisms, we find very complicated machines, uh, organs, uh, molecules, molecular machines, cells, and so forth. Uh, even single unicellular organisms have phenomenally complex molecular machines within them. So disregarding the time problem and the environment problem, you have the internal problem that one mutation at a time isn't going to cut it. You cannot build these sorts of structures one mutation at a time. Um, now you might say, well, we can get two mutations at a time if you get really lucky. If you're in the right universe, maybe you get three, maybe you get four. Uh, how far can you stretch this? Not very far. You can't get very many beneficial mutations um, with one individual. So you can't build these, these molecular machines that require so many, such a large number of molecular uh, of, of, of um, changes to, uh, to construct them. So there's that. Um, another problem is you know, evolution requires large scale changes, um, entire changes to body plans and new, new organs altogether, new appendages and so forth. There's even evolutionists have, have recognized now for years that you can't build those sorts of things through small scale evolution, um, moving along slowly, integrating those up, building, accumulating those sorts of small changes. That's the patterns that we see in biology do not reveal that. They don't show that. That's not the way it could happen. Um, the patterns that we see require some sort of larger scale changes to occur that we do not see in biology. So even evolutionists are reckoning and realizing, oh, this isn't working. So we got these four different problems, major problems with this foundational idea that it's the genome supplying the information and you're mutating the genome one or a few mutations at a time. Um, another problem is just looking at the genomes themselves how could these genomes provide this much information? It just doesn't seem to make sense when we look at them. For example, the human genome has something like 750 megabytes of information. That's really uh, stretching uh, credulity to think that 750 megabytes could code for the creation from scratch, practically, uh, of a human being. And then the operation of the human being. This is this is really stretching it. Um, so there's that. So those, those, those are problems with this, with this idea. But there's another problem that often is not even talked about. And that is from embryology, we just, that's just not what we see. The, the evidence is not that the genome supplies all the information creating the anatomy. It's just simply not what the science is showing. And this brings us to this, this new Michael Levin paper that's coming out. So let's have a look at this. Here's the paper. Competency of the developmental layer alters evolutionary dynamics in an artificial embryogeny model of morphogenesis. So what do the authors say here? Well, they talk about this problem that uh, the information in the genome is not 
solely responsible. You can't just take that information and build the, build the anatomy. And so let's read a little bit in the introduction here. Real organisms emerge as the results of a complex set of interactions among cells with anatomical order and functionality being the result of cellular activities. Hmm, that's interesting. So they're talking about cells and cellular activities, not just the genomes. Let's read on here. While genomes specify the cellular hardware, it is the software studied by biologists that is ultimately responsible for the organism's overall structure and behavior. Okay, so they're making an analogy to computers, hardware, and software. But you get the point here that they're saying there's something more than just what the genomes provide. Something extra. Genomes are not the only thing in town here. That's skipping down. It is currently impossible to guess the anatomy of an organism by examining its genome. Overall symmetry type, number and types of organism size, regenerative capacity, etc can only be estimated if one compares a genome to that of another organism for which all of these things are already known. So in other words, if you have another similar species, you know its genome and you know what its anatomy looks like, then, and you find you're now looking at this new species and it has a similar genome, you can say, oh, these are similar, so it's gonna kinda look like that one. In other words, comparative studies you're not really understanding why the genome is producing these things. You're simply finding another species with a similar genome. Well, again, this is a problem that the, the point here is you are unable to pick this out from the genome alone. Let's read some more here, skipping down. Moreover, the simple story of genomes determining anatomy is shown to be incomplete by examples such as the highly regenerative planarian. So he talks about different species and different examples where this just isn't the case. You, the anatomy is not being determined by the genomes, um, regardless of the nutrients available in the environment and so forth. It just isn't happening. Uh, let me skip down to the salamander example. Salamanders whose limbs or eyes, jaws, tails, etc., are amputated will regrow exactly the missing portion and then stop when the correct structure is complete. So you can do all kinds of things with salamanders. They regrow back to the way they were. And some, there's, there's some higher level of intelligence uh, at a higher level than just the, merely the genome at work there. Very interesting. And all this is to say that this model has broken down. The genome is not providing is not the sole source of information for the anatomy. This, remember what we said a minute ago, this is crucial to evolutionary theory. You have to have this. If this fails, evolution fails. Well, it has failed. Yet again, I gave five examples of failures that have been known for years. This is another one that is well known and still trying to be understood. It is a false prediction, a false prediction of a yet another false prediction of evolutionary theory. So what are they going to do about this? Well, here's back to the introduction. The layer of control that sits between genomes and the anatomy is developmental physiology. Aha, developmental physiology. So this is what the, the structure, the, the, the evolutionary idea is. Um, Yes, the genome doesn't just simply provide information instructing the anatomy. Rather, it feeds into this developmental layer. And so that does the job. And genome is only part of the story. Does this help? Let's have a look at how they describe this here. The competency of that developmental layer, that's this developmental physiology middle layer, the competency of, that, of the developmental layer has been proposed to result from the navigation policies of a collective intelligence of cells in anatomical morphospace as an evolutionary precursor to the intelligence of neural cells, which are, well, uh, uh, oh boy. You see where we're going with this. What happens, this happens every time. Evolution is always wrong. It's always uh, generating false predictions. 
That's the history of evolutionary thought, one false prediction after another. And that's followed by a makeup, a, a patch, a new complexity. The theory grows exponentially in complexity as they make up new stories, new narratives. Oh, well, this happened and that happened. And it's much more complicated. And just look at this now. Um, it's a result of the navigation policy. So when we now have a policy, um, it's not like a political body. Uh, evolution has navigation policies of a collective intelligence. Evolution has a collective intelligence. Evolution has created this collective intelligence of cells. And where is this? Uh, it's in anatomical morpho space. Oh, okay, that's that's real clear. Uh, as an intel as an evolutionary precursor to the intelligence of neural cells. This is just storytelling. There's no scientific evidence for any of this. This is what we get with evolutionary theory when you have religion driving science. Now let me show you a tweet by Michael Levin about this paper that he put out here. And in this tweet, he's describing you know what these findings and how they think, wow, this, this middle layer is so much more important and how evolution created this middle layer. And here he states, evolution put most of the work into optimizing the algorithm. Okay, now let that sink in. Don't, don't just read that and let those words go by. Evolution put most of the work into optimizing the algorithm. No, that is false. That is a false statement. This is not my opinion. This is false because evolution does not work this way. This is teleological. Evolution doesn't put work into optimizing things. That's not how evolution works. This is a false teleological Aristotelian view that Levin is saying here in his tweet. It reveals the bankruptcy of evolutionary thought and how the science has contradicted the theory. Religion drives science and it matters.